Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the STED Talk, Spine Technology Education Discovery Debate, um, but also uh, really discourse. And today, the emphasis in the D will be on discovery. My name is Jens Chapman. It's June 2nd. I welcome you from a beautiful, sunny, uh, very bright uh, Seattle morning. Uh, this is a very special edition. It's the third time we've done this. Uh, our wonderful fellows uh, on the spine side will present uh, highlights of their research. Everybody will have an about five minutes time to present, and we'll have roughly about five minutes of discussion. Just to give you a framework, these are all ongoing research projects that are either being submitted, so they're red hot off the press, or in final stages of completion. And our fellows have worked very hard on this for all year long. They're absolutely wonderful. We uh, will try to put in 10 speakers, 10 different speakers. Three of them are mystery guests as the course of the day goes on. One of our fellows, Dr. Elias, sadly isn't here. He's on a vacation leave right now. So uh, you'll see six of the fellows. The other four will be mystery guests that I'll introduce as the day goes on. Without much further ado, I'll ask the first of our speakers, Dr. Paul McBride, and I'll ask them all to briefly introduce themselves also and tell us where they're going next. And all of them will have, as you see, uh, research subjects that range from very technical, clinically focused things to large scale epidemiologic um, studies. So we're proud of all of them and congratulate them on their work. Dr. McBride will take the first lead and he'll talk about something that's very near and dear to our heart, and that is how do we manage the junctional areas above fusions if there's a possibility for a stenosis evolving. Dr. McBride, thanks for all your hard work. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, my name is Paul McBride. I'm a neurosurgery resident at uh, USF in Tampa, Florida. I'm here doing an enfolded fellowship at Swedish. Um, I'll be starting off with the paper that I'm working on, still currently in process of working on. It's called uh, Working Title Now is a Posterior Ligamentous Complex Integrity at the Cranial Segment of Lumbar Instrumented Fusion and its Effect on Adjacent Segment Disease. This is a retrospective review study. So when I, when I sat down to come up with a research paper, I, I originally wanted to work on doing a laminectomy above a fusion. Um, but as I thought about it more and started doing some uh, literature review, I realized that the important thing really was the ligamentous complex between the UIV and the UIV plus one. Um, it doesn't make much difference if you do a full laminectomy at the UIV versus taking the inferior laminectomy of the, of the vertebrae above the fusion or any higher than that. It's really just that connection that provides you that posterior tension band between your fused and your unfused segment. So I sort of morphed the project into uh, more focusing on that, uh, that segment specifically. And so um, the thought being that if you preserve the posterior ligamentous complex between the UIV and the UIV plus one in lumbar fusions, you'll decrease the rate of radiographic and symptomatic adjacent segment disease. Now, some people have looked at this before. This is a nice diagram from this paper here back in 2004, where they looked at this and they used um, a couple rudimentary radiographic parameters. Um, they did show that um, if you preserve the ligamentous um, tension band, it was only 6.5% of what they called instability, and that was just a radiographic cutoff versus 24% if you didn't. Um, and then there's several biomechanical studies. This one's in a pig model on the right, showing that it does, in fact, give you more stability, uh, particularly in flexion, um, as, as uh, having that tension band there. So I thought I'd look at this um, a little deeper with our patients, um, as we pretty frequently um, will spare the midline and preserve that ligament um, in our constructs. So uh, the study design, so the cohort of patients we're looking at is anybody over 18 who underwent an open midline posterior lumbar fusion uh, for degenerative pathology. And I'm looking at 2015-2016 uh, just to get as long as follow-up as we can, um, excluding infection tumor just to keep things um, in the degenerative category. Uh, revision cases uh, are allowed if there's a new UIV involved. Um, so far, we have over 200 patients that we're going through, and I'm dividing uh, the patients into three groups. The first group here is I, and this is a representative picture of one of our patients from the study in the group I. You can see that uh, this patient is fused from L4 to S1, and you can see that L4, the complete spinous process, is here. And so this is inferring that the ligamentous complex, including the supraspinous uh, and interspinous ligaments um, between these two spinous processes are present. Therefore, that tether is present between your fused and your unfused segment. This, sec this uh, top right photo, D, is a representative picture of this group where that ligament is disrupted. And you can see the spinous process of the UIV in this uh, patient that was fused L4 to L5 for a, a small spondy. Um, this spinous process was bitten down. 
And so this ligament is no longer there, tethering the fuse to the unfused uh, segment. And this third uh, group, uh, M, is uh, what I'm calling midline sparing laminotomies at the UIV plus one. And what this means, this is something that we frequently do here, is where we leave the, the posterior ligamentous complex intact, but we do laminotomies on either side and decompress uh, both centrally and the lateral recesses, as well as the foramen at that level. And you can see on this uh, AP x-ray, it's probably tough to see, but the, I'm circling two uh, lucencies, and those represent the laminotomies at the lamina above the uh, fused construct. And so um, I think this is um, important because uh, I think surgeons um, don't necessarily, when they do a, a T lift, um, don't necessarily, um, you know, mind this this junction. They, you know, frequently will bite the whole spinous process off of the of the UIV, like like you see here in D. Um, and, and it doesn't really accomplish much because you're not addressing the stenosis at the disc base above by doing that. Um, and you could potentially be destabilizing that adjacent segment. And so I think if this if this bears out, it could um, have some impact on on how we perform one of our most routine surgeries. And so the outcomes that I'm looking at uh, primarily is going to be reoperation rate, um, particularly um, extension of fusion at the uh, cranial adjacent segment. And so hopefully there will be some meaningful difference between um, groups I, D, and M in terms of reoperation rate and uh, extending the fusion cranially. I'm also going to look at some radiographic parameters um, to see if uh, radiographically these levels appear more unstable uh, between the groups. And those are the the um, the parameters that I'll be looking at, um, and hopefully I'll have at least two-year follow-up for, for these patients, and we can get some meaningful data. So thank you. Very good. Thank you, Paul, and uh, congratulations on selecting this topic. All of our fellows select their own topics and uh, pursue them. Uh, I want to introduce you to Dr. Joe DeTore. Uh, can we switch to Dr. DeTore? He's a PhD and um, serves as our head methods uh, coordinator. Dr. DeTore, good morning. Um, my question to you is a methodological one. So this is a single system, single center uh, retrospective review. It's a pretty large number of cases. As a methodologist and somebody who's written major review uh, articles and helps us also with the Global Spine Journal, uh, Science and Spine section, when you see multi versus single center uh, retrospective reviews, where do you see the pros and cons of both approaches? We can't hear you, Joe. Okay. Good morning, Joe. It's Dr. Joe Dictor, he's a PhD, and we have to unmute him. And he's still muted. Yeah, there, there we go. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear, and we can see you yeah. well. Good morning. Well, good morning. Thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. Reviews, thanks. pros and cons. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so, well, the... the uh, the big, the big issue that people need to remember when they do uh, these kinds of reviews is, is the proportion of people that are going to have the outcome. That'll drive the sample size, whether it's a single center study or, or whether it's a multi-center study. And, uh, and so, you know, how often in general uh, does somebody have to undergo a reoperation? That's what you need to consider. If it occurs, you know, two and two percent of the population, for example, your sample size is going to need to be quite large. On the other hand, if it if it occurs more frequently, then you're going to be okay. Um, and so that would be that would be the biggest issue. And then, of course, if you have the the pros of doing it in a single center study is that you control for uh, the uh, number you limit the number of surgeons uh, because there's a confounding effect on on the person doing the operation and the, and the people around the, the surgeon who's taking care of the patient. Um, the, uh, so that's, that's the, the advantage for a single center uh, study. The advantage for a, a multi-center study is of course you have uh, a greater uh, variety of, of patients and, and so you can apply the results to a wider population. So in short, that, those are sort of the biggest pros for each. So this is a very important point. So how often does something happen? Paul, take up this uh, thought. 
in your best estimate and review of the literature and preparation for formulating the study, how often does a patient with a spine fusion need to undergo a revision surgery over a five-year course? What's your best guesstimate from the literature? I would say probably 25 to 30% um, in the general population. Of course, some percentage of those patients go elsewhere for their surgery. Um, so we lose maybe none of those people. So I'm seeing probably about 15%. Um, in our cohort. So this is exactly uh, what Dr. Dettori was mentioning. So this is not an infrequent occurrence. Uh, roughly about uh, the sport trial said easily 22%, as I remember, over uh, after the five-year mark required some form of a revision. And again, it's been hotly debated whether it's uh, or whether adjacent segment wear and tear is an expected or an iatrogenic uh, problem. Sometimes it can clearly be iatrogenic. So in your gestalt, and mechanically speaking, if you preserve the uh, adjacent segment, how much mechanical gain, how much improved stability do you have by preserving the PLC, the posterior ligamentous complex? I think there's a good amount. You know, I think um, particularly in flexion, and that's what our biomechanical studies show, and that makes sense intuitively. You know, when you bend forward, that ligamentous complex in the back prevents you from overbending and will uh, reduce the stress on the disc space. There's a lot of things in the back, the, the supraspinous, infraspinous, the ligamentum flavum, like in D, the ligamentum flavum is still preserved. But I think the crucial thing is the supraspinous and interspinous ligament. And so I think uh, over time, that will that does provide some statistically meaningful difference in the rate of adjacent segment disease in, in patients. When I asked my partner and uh, on the spine service, the director of our uh, spine service, Dr. Uh, Oskuyan, so obviously the option M, the midline spraying laminotomies above, are a little bit more difficult surgery. In your own practice, do you try to preserve the midline, or do you, because it's so much easier, just kind of take everything off, uh, listed as option I by Dr. McBride? Yeah, I mean, we try to uh, spare. Um, obviously, each case is a little different, um, but I, I definitely agree with Paul. I think this is an underappreciated, um, underestimated uh, problem, and I think it can set you up for different problems down the road. So we try to preserve the adjacent level, but um, it hasn't really been looked at. So I think this is a great uh, project, Paul. So, uh, Ben, final sorry, uh, Paul, a uh, final question. Um, we see Ben Shell here on the screen. Uh, so, your listing of patients that had had the surgery in 2015, that was done with the design that you'll have more long term follow up. Is that right? Right. right. Yeah. With the ability to extend further uh, through the years if yeah. needed, if we need more patients, if that percentage uh, ends up being too small to provide a, a meaningful. Yeah, Dr. Dettori's statement of uh, right. always looking at the incidence of how often something occurs so you don't end up with microscopic numbers that are very arbitrary and right. spurious and likely subject to confounding things. So theoretically, you'll be in that 22% window that the SPORT trial identified following fusions. Good. Great job. We'll switch to our next lecture. And uh, thank you very much. And please stay around if you can, because we have a surprise visitor for you later also. So seamless transition, next is Dr. Zach Carterin, and he is going to talk about a subject that a surprise guest number one was involved with also, Dr. Ben Shell, and we'll ask Dr. Ben Shell to comment on that later. Dr. Ben Shell uh, is a former fellow of ours, and he is now uh, practicing in South Carolina in Charleston, um, and the uh, the location is the uh, South Carolina Sports Medicine Orthopedic Center in Charleston, South Carolina. So, uh, Zach, take us forward with this project that you inherited so from Dr. Shell. You have your own projects also, but this was such a meritorious project that we really wanted to bring this to a uh, conclusion. So, good morning, Zach, and good morning in the East Coast. Uh, and thank you for joining us in a busy day, Dr. Shell. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is a wonderful project I inherited from Dr. Benjamin Shell. <laughs> Um, and it's a project I kind of grew to believe in because uh, I'll show you a number of pictures like this on the right side of multi-rod constructs, but implementation of these multi-rod constructs have become increasingly popular over the past couple of decades, and there's really no consistent nomenclature for discussing uh, multiple rod spinal fusion constructs, especially in between uh, healthcare providers, uh, like spine surgeons trying to relate in as few words as possible what exactly is going on with the patient. 
Um, and so a system of nomenclature would definitely benefit discussions amongst colleagues, uh, would help in research, and ultimately probably lead to more standardized treatment options. Um, so the goal of the project that I inherited was to develop a multiple rod classification system with universal nomenclature. Um, so ultimately what was done was an international multidisciplinary group of 14 experts from United States, Israel, and Germany, and thought leaders were uh, compiled a uh, list of techniques, definitions, names from the literature were reviewed, and the expertise of the experts was utilized, and the list of criteria for the proposed nomenclature system was completed through a modified Delphi process, and four key questions were attempted to be answered. Um, one, how many rods were utilized? Two, how far rostral does the construct extend? Three, what is the purpose of the working rod, which is typically the rod that is placed lower and bears most of the load, uh, the shorter rod of the two on one side? And three, how much, if any, pel pelvic fixation was utilized? Um, and so this is the the score, the trendy name for the, the scoring system that was developed, uh, the Chrome score classification of heterogeneous rods for multiple etiologies. Um, and this is a picture of Chrome, the score in a nutshell. So it's a, a four digit score. Um, first, first number being number of rods used, uh, second number uh, being the rostral most fusion spanning rod. Uh, so how high does the construct go? And it's broken down into uh, the categories one through four. Uh, third is a letter, uh, which is the reason for the working rod. And we broke it down into five, which was deformity, pseudoarthrosis, infection slash tumor, neuropathic and trauma. And the last one is simply a plus or a minus. Uh, pelvic fixation. If there is greater than two screws in the pelvis, they get a plus. Uh, if there's under that, they do not get a plus or a minus. Um, so what we ultimately did is we have a research meeting here every Monday morning at SSF. And uh, we used the expertise of six spine fellows and three spine attendings. And we gave them a quiz uh, of the pictures that I've shown. These are all pictures from the quiz uh, on the right here. So I would put this slide up for a minute and everyone would just look at the picture. And uh, after a brief tutorial on the Chrome score, they would score the picture. Um, and then four weeks later, uh, we repeated the same exact quiz with the same fellows and the same attendings. Uh, we found an excellent inter-rater kappa coefficient of 0 0.71 and intra-rater reliability was 0 0.68 which is classified as good reliability. Um, and we are just completing the manuscript as we speak and getting it ready for submission. If I have 30 seconds each, I can talk about other projects that I'm working on, or we can just discuss. Um, Let's do this right now. So thank you for uh, taking this project over. This is one of the lights of a very busy place like ours, uh, and that is uh, to kind of complete projects in time in the academic year. And Dr. Schell really took it upon himself with a lot of energy to put this over. But before I go to Dr. Schell, um, Dr. DeTore, Joe, um, what is ideally a Delphi process? I see this a lot in the literature, and uh, in very brief sentences, how does an ideal Delphi process look and work? Well, I would I would say that um, for for clinicians, uh, for surgeons, spine surgeons, I would say sort of a modified Delphi process is is sort of the ideal situation. And and basically, the Delphi process is not an end of itself. It's 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 a sort of an intermittent step, which tends to help narrow down a topic um, with input from uh, the experts. And then once a topic is narrowed down, in this case, 
it, it needs to be, it needs to have, I mean, there are, there are probably a dozen different ways one can come up with a classification system. And you can look at all kinds of different things, but, but there's probably real important components that need to be included. And it's the clinical experts that need to provide that input as opposed to just picking out random variables and stick them into a computer model or a mathematical model and have the model determine what those are. And so the, the ideal is for clinical experts to come up with um, the, the, the variables that can then be looked at more closely uh, through statistical analysis. But let me say this, that the Delphi process initially was designed to be done so that people who have big personalities don't influence, over influence other people. And so in reality, uh, that can be done a number of ways. Um, one of the ways is that you, you, you vote sort of secretly what your opinion is about various things. And it's up to the moderator to, to, to keep the person who has the most strong opinion from dominating the conversation. So everybody's input is heard equally. That's some very valuable insight. So um, I'll switch over to Dr. Ben Schell again. Dr. Ben Schell is here from South Carolina, and he was a past fellow. We asked him, and I see Dr. Ryan Goodmanson, who's also in the same shoes, a past fellow. Morning, Ryan. Um, we'll introduce you separately later as a mystery guest uh, number, I think, three. But thank you for joining us in your busy practice as well. Dr. Ben Schell, so when you took on this project, why did you want to take this on? And how did you modify this uh, Delphi process to make it as above board as possible? And, inf and take away the influence of uh, big speakers like Dr. Oskuyan, not myself, but Dr. Oskuyan. Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> great question, great question. Uh, thank you, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's good to see you guys, all the uh, virtually. Um, but yeah, uh, to answer, you know, it, it was just something that kind of became apparent as we were seeing so many outside consults that had multi-rod constructs that look like little piece here, little piece there, little, you know, something here to tie off to, you know, to something else. And it just got really frustrating for us when um, we were trying to revise these. And I would try to either tell Dr. Chapman or Dr. O and, you know, my co-fellows, even Ryan, like, oh, this lady's got this, this, and this, but you're not going to understand it till you look at these x-rays. So, that's kind of what the uh, the impetus was that ignited the fire. And, um, you know, to make the Delphi process as, you know, I guess, uh, you know, universally accepted as we could, um, I originally attempted to get as many people involved as possible. You know, we started with a big picture, um, trying to recruit people at the courses up at SSF and, you know, trying to get people to do it online um, from various parts of the world. And, um, you know, as with all things, you know, during COVID, things got kind of hectic and turned upside down and the response wasn't uh, what we wanted it to be. So, uh, you know, I'm super thankful to Zach to kind of pick up the reins and uh, push this thing through to the end and, and really uh, cement it to be, uh, um, you know, something quality and, and worth publishing. So um, I'd, kudos to him for sure. To Zach and you, so uh, in the literature, has anybody tried to formally classify these rods and how did you come up with the uh, a rod nomenclature in terms of what these rods actually do or how do you call those various rods that are put in there? Um, sure. there's, there's various uh, papers in the literature discussing techniques of multiple rod implementation, uh, such as kickstand rods, outrigger rods, satellite rods, um, but no real paper that comes in and tries to bring them all together and come up with a universal nomenclature system, which is kind of why I grew to strongly believe in the paper. Um, so there was nothing like that um, in the literature. Um, and, and Ben, how did you put these words into, uh, how did you find the words to describe these rods? How did you do that? That was that was kind of what the, the original Delphi process was. You know, I started bugging you guys and we had our weekly research meetings. We would pass around papers and what words do people think of? What words you're using now? What word makes sense to your brain? And, uh, you know, we we slowly whittled it down, you know, from 10 words to five words to three words and had people kept voting and people kept talking about, OK, you know, this is the rod that's doing the bulk of the work. That's that makes sense. Let's call that the working rod. This is the rod that's spanning the construct. Let's call that the spanning rod. You know, it, we wanted to make it as intuitive as we could. And that's kind of where those words originated from, because 
you know, like Zach said, there are a uh, um, throw of them in the literature and, you know, some, to some people an outrigger rod is this, to some people it's a kickstand rod, to some people it's, you know, just the long rod. So uh, it's definitely uh, was a work in progress, but um, I think, I think the words that we landed on uh, really describe it well. So the, yeah, I think he really did a great job and I'm very grateful that Zach picked up this project. Um, very briefly, Joe, before I'll ask Ben to uh, give us a little uh, five minute uh, view a year later, um, a Kappa value of 0.7, uh, if you go back to that slide, Zach, um, is that a good thing or uh, 0.71, is that a good thing? Is that a mediocre thing? How, what's a good Kappa value and what's a good inter -rate, intra rate of reliability? Uh, yes, yeah, so the the kappa value of 0 0.7, there are different there are different correlation coefficients that tend to measure agreement and taking into account chance. That's kappa, um, and so uh, anything anything above 0 0.6 is good, um, and so 0 0.71 is 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 good, very good, and I would I'd be per particularly happy with that. Um, uh, end result. I think um, as we were going along, I can't remember Ben, but initially when we were first started this project, the initial uh, number was a little bit lower than that. So I'm glad to see that it's up to uh, 0.7 now. Great. Thank you. So we'll switch over back to uh, Charles and Dr. Shell. Congratulations on your first year. Uh, a year ago, you were standing here uh, giving a view of your project, and here it's hopefully coming to a close soon, Zach. So give us uh, your words of what were your biggest surprises uh, that you encountered in practice? Uh, what is the word of wisdom that you want to impart on our fellows? Uh, I think I have. I think I have two. Um, if I can hopefully squeeze them both in. So I think. Uh, the biggest thing that I really, you know, discovered was you as a fellow, you are, you know, you're in the trenches, you're taking care of patients, you're in clinic all the time, your, your volume is, is high, you know, you're doing a lot of cases, you know, you're doing every type of case every week, and you don't think twice about it. And then, you know, you come out as a, as a new attending, and I went into private practice. So there, you know, it wasn't like people waiting on me uh, to show up, um, you know, with cases ready. So, it takes a little while to build that and, and you're, you don't notice it at first, but suddenly it's been three weeks since you've done an anterior neck, or it's been, you know, two or three weeks since you've done a T-lift and it's, it, you notice that certain moves aren't as intuitive as they were before. So you got to kind of have to do some things on the side, uh, to keep your skills up. You know, you're, um, you go to courses, you do cadaver labs in your cities, you try out new instrumentation with young companies that are always wanting people to test out their stuff. So it's, it's definitely something that I didn't uh, anticipate. You don't notice it at first. You don't think about it um, that, you know, not having uh, you know, done a complex neck, you know, in a month, it, the certain little things aren't as fast as they were. Um, and then my other big thing that, um, you know, I really appreciated at the time when Dr. Chapman would always tell me, but kind of coming into uh, a different, you know, different state, different coast, basically, they had done spine at my hospital, but you know, they hadn't done it the way that I do it. And you, um, every little thing matters. Dr. Chapman used to always tell us that every little thing matters. And when it's your name on the chart and you're the one responsible for that patient, you're the one seeing them in clinic all the time. Every little thing matters from, you know, positioning of the arm boards, you know, it's prevent a post-op neuropraxia from, you know, positioning of the eyeballs on the, you know, on the soft padded pillow, you know, or in the tongs. It's, it's not just anesthesia's problem. It's not just a nursing problem. Every little thing matters and it, and it should matter to you. And that's one of the amazing things about spine. That's one of the difficult things about spine. That's why, you know, not everybody can do it. And, um, you know, it's, these are the things we learned at Swedish and it's, you just have to take a little bit more time because, you know, you had, Swedish, you had an attending and a fellow doing all those things, or you had two fellows and the attending coming in, or you had a lot of hands and a lot of people and a lot of experienced people. And that's not always the case in every hospital you go to. So you've got to make sure that you have your checklist, either in your mind or before the case. And you've, you know, you've kept it for the year at Swedish and you're kind of writing the little things down. Okay, got to make sure to do this, got to make sure to do that. Um, and then these are the 10 other things that before we scrub, I got to make sure all these things are in line. So uh, those are the big things for me is that um, be cognizant of the volume for sure. Cause it will, it will change, you know, you're not going to come out to, you know, 10, 12 
cases a week um, and, you know, be cognizant that every little thing matters because it does. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. And please feel free to stick around in our panelist room and to uh, comment on anything else you see. We'll stay totally on time. And thank you all for staying so much on time. Dr. Puri Hayumi joined us from uh, USC and LA. And we have a mystery guest um, joining us. Uh, good morning, Dr. Jeff Wong. He's the vice chair of orthopedic surgery at USC and the chief of the spine service. And he served as a mentor and I think uh, inspiration for Dr. Hayumi to go into spine. We've been very privileged to have Puriya here. And he's gonna talk about a research presentation of his, uh, that's a project that he's done over the last year and we'll ask Dr. Wong to critique it. So, yeah. All right, Puriya, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Chaplin. Good morning, Dr. Wong. So I'll be presenting my research study that I've been doing for the past year or so. The, the title is Relationship of Cervical Imaging Parameters as Predictors of Construct Failure and Posterior Long Cervical Fusion. As background, uh, posterior cervical fusion is being used increasingly. Uh, there was almost a threefold increase from 2001 to 2013 um, in the United States. And this has been attributed to the aging population, greater number of fellowship trained spine surgeons. However, there are uh, much fewer studies published on posterior uh, cervical fusions compared to the anterior approach. And even fewer studies have reported on long construct posterior spinal fusions. Uh, so the aim of our study, this is a retrospective clinical study. Uh, uh, the aim was to correlate the preoperative radiographic imaging, uh, including sagittal measurements of the cervical spine and clinical comorbidities and CT-based bone density as measured on that with using Hounsfield units uh, to measure outcomes, including health, hardware failures, non-unions, and reoperations. Uh, in terms of the cervical uh, parameters that we use, there's been a large number of sagittal parameters defined uh, and studied, not as extensively as lumbar parameters, but uh, these include uh, cervical lordosis, cervical SVA, T1 slope, thoracic inlet angles, and neck tilt. Uh, out of all these, neck tilt is, uh, I'm sorry, T1 slope probably has been studied most extensively, including Dr. Wong uh, that has studied that using uh, kinematic MRIs. Um, so we use that as kind of uh, the parameter, uh, the main parameter that we use uh, in addition to cervical SVA and uh, lordosis. And we use uh, also coronal cob angle uh, in our measurements as well. So the methods that we use, we use uh, all patients that had any long segment posterior fusion, and we define that as anything that includes upper cervical from C2 to at least uh, upper thoracic T1 between 2015 and 2018 that was done at our facility. Uh, the radiographic measurements, as we discussed, uh, was cervical lordosis, SVA, T1 slope, and coronal cob angle, uh, immediately pre-op, post-op, and at least six months follow-up. And uh, as I showed in that picture, we measured our Hounsfield unit using an ROI angle on a T1, um, mid-T1 vertebral body, um, uh, excluding cortical, uh, cortical bone. The results uh, and the outcomes that we were looking at, as I mentioned, we were looking at hardware failures, non-unions, reoperations, and et cetera. Uh, preliminary results so far, we haven't done the final statistical analysis. So we ended up having 79 patients that met our inclusion criteria and had the minimum follow-up that we needed. Uh, the number of revision surgeries total were 13, and this includes everything, including harbor failure, uh, infection, seroma, uh, so all common, basically. Uh, revision just for infection slash seroma, there were four patients, and for harbor failure, there were six of them. And uh, uh, interestingly, most of them, majority of them were caudal and failures. Uh, the average T1 slope, uh, post-op T1 slope was 38, and for an average T1 slope uh, in patients with caudal and failure, I expected it to be larger, uh, given that, that the amount of shearing force uh, that would be on the T1, um, uh, T1 vertebral body, but uh, it was 41. Interestingly, for uh, our Hounsfield unit, average T1 uh, Hounsfield unit for all our patients was 235, but only including the five patients that had caudal and failure, uh, the uh, T1 uh, Hounsfield unit was significantly lower, and it was 194. 
the weakness of the study, it's a retrospective study and uh, our follow-up is only six months to be able to have a large number of patients included in the study. Um, the no PROs are included, unfortunately. Uh, and the, the, the other big thing is that the discrepancy in measurement between uh, upright x-rays and CT, wherever we had available, we use upright x-rays. As you can see, this is the same patient. Both, uh, both of them are post-op imaging and that the measurement of SVA and lordosis, there is a difference between the two, between CT and upright x-ray. And in some patients, actually, that discrepancy can be even larger. Uh, so that's something that we definitely have to address in the final paper. Thank you. So thanks for this very concise uh, overview. Can you go back to that last uh, picture? Um, was the postoperative immobilization uh, categorized? Have you caught that? Is there a difference of using a regular hard collar or some form of a cervical thoracic orthosis? That's not something that we looked at specifically in this study. And in your, so that's one other yeah, thing to add to absolutely. the weaknesses, but I think it's a very meritorious study. And again, it's very humbling to see reoperation rates. Um, uh, how well or how much do we know about the uh, ROI, the region of interest calculations, which have been well established as a screening tool for the thoracolumbar spine lower down? How well, how consistently has that been actually evaluated and kind of crossed over into the upper thoracic spine? So not as much. Uh, I've found maybe three studies that looked at it and definitely not in the setting that we're looking at. One of them was to look at subsidence rate after ACDFs and the way that they measure it, and there's no kind of standard measurement of uh, cervical ROI as well. Each study kind of had a different way of uh, measuring it, either using sagittal, using averages on the axial view. So that's something that we have to address. Uh, the way we do it is basically the way it's done in the lumbar uh, in the lumbar spine is looking on the axial view kind of mid body. Um, but again, there's definitely not as well studied in the cervical spine no definite standard way of measuring it. Great. So good morning, Dr. Wong. Thank you so much for joining us. Jeff, it's a real privilege to have you. Are you unmuted? Uh, yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, I, I don't know what you guys did to Poria. When he left USC, he had a full head of hair. I'm not sure what you guys did to him during the last year, though. He's transformed. His hair has transformed <laughs> to the lower half of his uh, head. Yeah, move down. Good morning, Dr. Well, Wong. Good morning, Pori. Listen, great study. This is a very practical uh, study. It's obviously a problem that would affect all of us when we're doing these long constructs down into the thoracic spine. And if we could have find some way to predict which ones are going to fail, which ones we need to go down lower past T1, um, I think that would be a huge benefit to the spine world. Uh, I guess my question to you is, is when, when you say hardware failure, how, how did these fail? I know you didn't have a ton of failures. And so I think you talked about the fact that you don't you don't have a lot of patients in that group, uh, but but how did they fail? Did they pull out? Did, did they sort of fracture at that distal junction? Majority of them were fractures at the LIV or LIV, uh, well, I guess minus one. Um, so kind of a burst fracture either through the screws at T1 or T2 or the level right level below. Okay. And, and I, I imagine you looked at everything. And so the, the only thing you found was that the T1 slope was just a little bit higher in the ones that fail. Yeah, I was hoping that we would find something. Uh, and uh, obviously bone density was significantly lower in that group, but the T1 slope, I expected it to be much higher in the group that failed, but it doesn't seem to be that much of a difference, at least based on very preliminary analysis. Okay, and did they all go down to the T1 and they fail, or did, you, did it make a difference whether you stopped at T1 or T2, or they were just kind of doomed to fail? I think the majority of them actually ended up at T2. I think that seems to be the standard here that we end at T2 or lower. Yeah. We use the T1 uh, slope because that's the parameter that's been defined um, for the cervical spine. Sure. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing about some of these studies is that, um, I, I mean, I, when I heard you present it, you were like, well, we found the T1 slope, you expected it to be a little higher. But I think a lot of these studies, sometimes finding negative data is very valuable because yeah. I would have suspected that, you know, if they had more um, regional imbalance and they were really off, that it'd be more likely to fail. And if you find that that didn't affect it, that's huge, right? Yeah. Or you find all these other parameters you looked at and then you found that those were not associated with distal failure. I, I think that's important information that needs to be out there. Uh, nice. So I, I commend you for this study. I, I commend your mentors for, for coming up with the ideas and helping you through this. And I would encourage you to continue this through to publication because this is very practical information. 
And, and just because you don't find a lot of positive data associated with it um, kind of tells us, it makes us feel good as surgeons because if we see it, we say, hi, hey, we couldn't have predicted it. Um, but, but at the same time, having all that negative data out there showing it was not associated with all these other parameters maybe helps us uh, get, guide us a little bit more and maybe feel a little bit better about our patients. Thank you. Dr. So thanks for joining us, Jeff. Uh, quickly, uh, for two or three minutes, give us your clinical paradigm in cervical thoracic fixations. When should we stop at one, two versus lower? Uh, are there some tips and tricks? And I'll give you a compound question. Uh, do you use the ROI calculations in the upper thoracic spine to try to guide us? Is that a valid measurement? Is that at this point just too raw? Yeah, I, I don't really use that measurement. And, and yet sometimes you just look at these and you just get a sense, of, hey, this one, I, get, I need to go further. This one's, uh, I, it's going to fail. Uh, I guess for, for me, uh, I, I look a lot at the, um, the angle between um, uh, C7 and T1. Uh, because in some of the data we looked at is that a lot of the people that had the most imbalance, they had either a neutral or they were a little kyphotic there at, at C7, T1. And that angle really, um, if, if, it's, if it's neutral or kyphotic, then I try a little harder. Uh, I may go a little bit more distal. I, I don't want to approach sort of the uh, thoracic kyphosis, but uh, I tend to go a little bit uh, lower on those. A lot of times, if, if, if that angle isn't so bad, I'll stop at T1. Um, I, I tended to think, obviously, if there was a lot of regional imbalance and they were really imbalanced and I was really working hard to get them back, that I would go a little bit lower. So I, I actually thought that you were going to find that if they were off and the regional imbalance was worse and, and, and the C2 to uh, C7 plumb line was way off, that you would find more failures. And so I, I'm kind of, uh, uh, kind of happy that you're not seeing that association. Certainly doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, I would encourage you guys to get more numbers on that. But it, again, very practical information. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Puria, uh, hopefully you'll conclude this wrap so you don't have to pass this off because uh, as you heard from Dr. Wong, this is a very meritorious subject. Jeff, one, one more question to you is uh, any words of wisdom for our fellows uh, from somebody who's been at the pinnacle of the, our profession and one of our major leaders? Uh, well, um, my, I guess my advice is you never stop learning. I think you guys know that. Um, you obviously had great mentors during this year, but never stop learning. Never keep your mind closed. Um, I, I think when you go out there and you see people that are, are very successful um, and the ones that maybe are, are, haven't achieved what they wanted to achieve, I think the people that are most successful have a little bit more of an open mind. Um, even at my age, I, I'm getting old. I still try to keep an open mind and, and try to learn new things. And I don't get too set in my ways because I think life is a learning experience. That's a wonderful thing in spine. And again, everything counts, as Dr. Shell said. And uh, it never ceases to amaze me what we learn. And we appreciate the hard work of our fellows and the insights that you gain. And the sometimes difficult mirror uh, that uh, we're confronted with when we critically look at our results. Uh, always strive to get better. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. It's a huge privilege and a great uh, joy for all of us to have you. And it was great to have Dr. Hayumi here and this connection to USC. So we, we did rib him a little bit about the LA background. So, uh, but that's for a different forum to discuss further. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Take care, guys. Good to see you. Take care. Thank bye you, bye. Dr. Wong. Thank bye. you. See you for you. All right. Next, we have a fellow from Germany. So we're staying international from LA to Germany to Bochum. Dr. Perry Gedolius is going to talk about his basic sciences research, and he's had a couple of interesting projects. We have to limit it to one. So good morning, Perry. Hi, thanks for having me. Okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Chapman. Peritus Godolius is my name. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and trauma surgeon uh, from Germany, from uh, University Clinic of Bochum. And uh, I'm uh, in a row of uh, my predecessors who spent here the last five years. So we're in the sixth year of our uh, German fellowship as SSF now. And um, after coming here, I got into the lateral spine surgery, really interested with that. And um, I have to take a little X course uh, after, before I uh, present my uh, cadaveric study that I was doing on the branches that actually innovate the um, psoas muscle. Um, because um, 
coming here, I was first time actually uh, experiencing lateral spine surgery. And uh, when you uh, go through the different trajectories, you see that, of course, you can go anterior to the psoas muscle or you can go trans psoas muscle. Mm -hmm. And uh, you start wondering what are the complications of these things. So I actually first started with uh, some chart review studies on the complication rates of uh, standalone uh, patients. We almost had 160 patients in this group. And we found out that um, basically the most common complication that we found was the temporary hip flexor weakness. Then I did the same thing for patients who had a, a lateral um, approach uh, followed by an ALIF or a, a different posterior approach. And here again, uh, because of the posterior instrumentation, you have a little bit um, higher incidences of bleeding complications, um, which are not that common in lateral uh, spine surgery. Uh, but then again, we had uh, like the temporary hip flexor weakness as the second highest uh, incidence again. And then I got into the literature and I was looking at what have other studies shown about the different anatomical uh, structures and trajectories of the branches of the lumbar plexus through the psoas muscle. And I found out that um, they were mainly focused actually on um, how the uh, distribution of the different branches is uh, carried out in the posterior wall uh, or they were um, taking MRIs and seeing if they can find uh, different safe paths through the psoas muscle um, by identifying the different um, trajectories in these um, <clears throat> planes. Um, I only found one study which actually really took a look at the branches that uh, came from the um, lumbar uh, nerve roots um, and innervated the plexus, uh, the, the psoas muscle. Uh, and they found that there were on average 6.3 branches which um, come from the anterior nerve root and innervate the psoas muscle, muscle which are at risk. Um, at a, uh, on a lateral spine surgery. So we have all these beautiful uh, anatomical um, illustrations in the books, and this is from Anatomy app, uh, which I have on my iPhone actually, which is pretty helpful sometimes. But it never shows you that uh, uh, what, what is happening to the uh, nerve roots which are inside the muscle, it always just focuses on the main uh, lumbar uh, plexus nerve roots that we all know. So what I wanted to do is uh, I wanted to dissect the plexus muscle, the, the psoas muscle on two uh, cadavers and actually see if I can um, illustrate the nerves that are inside the muscle and not um, taken care of or not even named, uh, let's say, uh, like this. So I elevated the psoas muscle and there you can see um, pretty beautifully uh, how the branches are um, distributed to form the uh, femoral nerve in the back of it. And after taking away uh, the psoas muscle, um, really diligently for like a whole week, I was able to expose um, this kind of, um, yeah, almost spider web of nerves, uh, which are connected to the um, sympathetic chain in the front, as you can see, uh, I left the tendon of the psoas muscle there to show that these nerves are even connected into the tendon and uh, there you can see uh, this nerve branches that are actually coming from the anterior root and um, all these things I've set up on the K-wire. They are inside the muscle belly and they are of course uh, being pressed on by the um, instruments that we insert there on a lateral trajectory. Um, but what we wanted to do is see if we can uh, take these things out of an MRI from the cadaver that we did the dissection on and work together with a, a company who does 3D prints um, for healthcare um, purposes um, in Belfast, Ireland. Um, so we had to mark all the nerves in the um, axial planes of the MRI to actually be able to differentiate them from the fat tissue. And uh, we got a sketch fab. Um, there we attached the disc levels and the psoas muscle on one side to it. And in the end, we were able to print that and we got these results. Um, the discussion will mainly be about that 3D printing yet uh, in medical senses is not able to show the uh, little nerve roots which go through the psoas muscle because we have the limit of one millimeter that we can actually print. Uh, in diameter and these nerves are mostly um, in smaller in diameter than one millimeter. Um, yeah, that's basically the project I'm working on right now.
So Perry, this is great. Uh, mm -hmm. I really commend you on taking a conceptual idea, uh, founding it in a clinical background scenario, and then taking it to the next step. What have you gained from your actual computer model, which is now actually an in vivo model? This is the reality. This mm -hmm. is not something compared to the computer diagrams that we saw before. If you juxtapose them both, what is different and what do you derive from that as a clinician? Well, as I said before, we were not able to um, show uh, the nerves which have a diameter less than one millimeter. So um, it's really hard to take this out of uh, the computer, computer model because you have to mark each and every nerve in every Excel slide. Um, so to me as a clinician, um, the 3D printing is yet not uh, precise enough technique to, let's say, get a 3D print for every patient I will do a lateral surgery on. Dr. Oskurian, so you're one of the three pioneers of uh, far lateral surgery. Uh, what insights have you gained from this and how would this affect your practice? Do you envision this becoming something that would exclude patients from this kind of a surgery? So I want to um, congratulate uh, Perry and Zach because they, this has never really been evaluated and looked at. Um, and actually, these little branches are what matter, um, these interconnections. Um, and this is a amazing dissection that these guys have done. Um, and it just shows you how complex the, the lumbar plexus is and how underappreciated um, it really is. And I think it's going to add a tremendous amount to the literature. So I can't, I'm so excited. And these three papers that they're working on are going to be game changers. So great job. Just okay. quickly, for our patients, what should we tell them uh, are the expected neurologic sequelae? And what is an expected kind of a byproduct, let's say a neuropraxic two to three week period versus something that's a significant uh, complication. So we so, draw the line. Yeah. So I tell all my patients, they all have 100% have hip flexor, hip extension, abduction, weakness mm -hmm. that's temporary. The numbness is almost exclusively, um, uh, uh, in, you know, 100% of them get numbness. Usually by six weeks, it's better. Um, the neurologic deficit is very low, um, but when you do have it, it's devastating because it's a it's like a peripheral nerve injury. Um, you hit multiple uh, muscle groups. Dr. Vittoria, are you with us, Joe? So one common question, I have a double question again. I always have double questions, it seems, and that is... Um, when we have an anatomic model, how can we correlate that uh, visual that we have here from, let's say, this computer-generated model to an in vivo model, which uh, we see in a cadaveric version? Is there any way to mathematically correlate that uh, uh, so we have kind of an anatomic correlation? When you see anatomic studies, we usually have single-digit cadaver numbers simply for practical reasons. What's a, a meaningful anatomic denominator to have? I don't, I really don't have an answer for that question because my, my area of expertise is really in, in clinical. I would say this, that, that, um, that, that's often the next step, right? Is after you have the, the anatomical, there has to be some kind of clinical, uh, correlation. So I wish I could give you a better answer, Jens, but I just, I, I don't know uh, with respect to numbers on anatomy. That's fair. This is a common problem for us. So. Uh, Perry, where do the sympathetics run in that diagram? Where would we expect? And did you see sympathetics? Or was that just below resolution at this point in time? Um, in the dissection, I have them, but in the diagram, we don't have them. Can you show with the cursor, using the cursor, where they would run on the spinal column? Like on the dissection, they are running here in the front. In the front, yeah, so yeah. anterolateral. Yeah. So the oblique uh, inner body fusion would hit those areas theoretically. Right. Did you find in your complications of you sympathectomy uh, uh, results, was that a factor in some of the post-operative complications that you saw? So uh, other authors have um, mentioned this uh, complication. Um, we, in our chart review, we haven't found any of these. Great. Okay. Well, we'll stay on time and um, we'll uh, switch our next lecture. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you. That's all. Thank you so much, Perry. And we have Ravi coming on. Yes. And maybe with the camera, Lee, can you, can you use pan outs to see uh, uh, Lindsay, our fellowship coordinator?
can you take the overhead robot camera back there while Stravi gets connected? I want to recognize our fellowship coordinator, this is Lindsay. Thanks for all you do. And we have Dr. Abdul Jabbar here, Amir, uh, new father. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we have Sue Thomas behind Amir. Can you wave? She was the previous fellowship coordinator. So thank you for all you do, guys. And we'll have Ravi go next. And he's talking about a all too common self chosen, so it seems, a vice and problem, and that is nicotine and spine. Yep. And thank you, Dr. Chapman. We have no picture right now, so let's see what's going on with that. I hope it's not some ransomware attack. I hope not. Is it your laptop's incompatibility? I don't think so. so. Dr. Ravi Nuna uh, came here from Chicago. It's a loose connector. Oh, here we are. There we go. So uh, thank you, Dr. Chapman, for that uh, kind introduction. So this year, I decided to do a project on uh, the risk of non-union and smokers. And um, we did... Lee, Lee, Lee. Your laptop. Yeah, it must be my laptop. So why don't you extemporize and talk for a second? Okay, so we did a meta-analysis on the risk of non-union in uh, smokers. And overall, for our study we um, sought to amalgamate as many of the articles um, were out there. The reason for our study was that um, obviously uh, nicotine is one of the uh, biggest issues in spine surgery today. Um, as a public health issue in the United States alone, cigarette smoking is associated um, is the leading cause of death and a preventable disease and disability and a death. Uh, it's been estimated that smokers comprise nearly 24% uh, to 32% of um, surgical spine patients. And obviously, as we've all seen in our practice, smokers have um, some of the highest risks. Uh, Rob, excuse me, we have a feed problem with your laptop, it you. seems. So we are. I bet it's the other one. Oh, that is the other one. Maybe this is my laptop. Are we live again? OK. All right. So this is a Pico table that um, we. Sorry. No, it's my Might laptop. Have to... Yeah, maybe should we just put it on chat email too? Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't realize it was filled in. Oh, my bad. This is very pertinent to your laptop, right? I think it's it's me. It's my fault. <laughs> so why don't we take this quick switch? Uh, Dr. Goodmanson, Ryan Goodmanson, are you there? Yes, can sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear, and we'll put you on next. Um, yeah, sounds great. Thanks for having me. Follow with us uh, last year. He's been one of the rock stars from our last year. And he's joining us from McLaren Port here on orthopedic surgery. He's a spine surgeon there and has been an immediate success story there from what I gather. Share with us over the next five minutes uh, what you've kind of seen as your biggest surprise as you've entered practice by yourself. Yeah, well, thanks again for having me. I would say uh, I would have to echo a lot of the things that Dr. Shell said at first, but I, would, I picked out two things and one is uh, patience and uh, limitations would be my two things to uh, take away. Um, that's piggybacking off of his stuff. You know, I'm coming to a facility that just didn't do a whole lot of spine and they really didn't do any complex spine. And when you come in guns blazing, uh, it's hard for them to uh, adapt to that. And so it's been learning to be very patient with them, learning to uh, uh, help them understand the details because we were taught the details very well, and I would echo that, that the, the devil is in the details, and you definitely have to pay attention to all that, but they maybe uh, haven't had that experience. And so to come in and to be that leader that they need, uh, be that person that they look to, and uh, to instill that in them, what was instilled in me has been um, challenging, but uh, a good. Um, it's been fun in some ways, and it's been uh, painful. Um, just learning to be very patient uh, with everybody um, and know that everybody is learning alongside me at the same time um, has been has been good. Uh, the other thing has been limitations. Again, the guns blazing. I want to come out and I want to do a T10 to pelvis on somebody or I want to come out and do a big surgery or I want to even do a, a C12 fusion or something like that. 
that I have to know the limitations of my hospital. Um, I work out of two different hospitals and one hospital has, uh, my main hospital does not have things like uh, neuro IR or uh, neuro CV backup. And so God forbid I get into trouble, I need to have that uh, backup and know what I have at my hospital. And so alongside that is creating relationships. I've noted that uh, creating relationships with people like neuro CV, neuro IR, and uh, those types of people, even ENT has come into play as of recently with a, uh, a fairly complex case that I have, which is a uh, ossification of anterior longitudinal and posterior longitudinal ligaments in this patient. So essentially a, a pretty robust dish um, has come into play. And so really um, exploiting those relationships, forming those relationships. And since it's the Midwest and everyone up here uh, is extremely nice, it has been fairly easy to do but at the same time, you're getting people out of their comfort zones a little bit. Um, and so you have to uh, not only push them, but uh, do it in a safe way. And so creating those relationships with people has been another thing that's been uh, fairly critical, I think, to the success that I've had so far and hopefully continue to have. Those are very valuable insights. So being cognizant of the environment and trying to build up uh, practices. Have you had a lot of team meetings? Uh, have you kind of been able to gel a spine team together composed of nursing, anesthesiology, PT, et cetera? Yeah, so we've been working on that. That has been uh, very challenging. Uh, they did not have uh, any interventionalists up here when I first started. And so we actually brought in uh, some interventionalists to uh, help us with our preoperative and our um, workup, our conservative treatment. So they've been uh, integral to that. Uh, working with our anesthesia, so taking things from Swedish that, uh, uh, you know, using the relationships at Swedish to then further that. Uh, here by giving my anesthesiologists uh, understanding of what we need in complex spine surgeries, what we need in bigger surgeries, um, as far as that goes. And then um, another team that has been uh, almost invaluable has been the ICU team. And thankfully, they do a lot of cardiac um, um, surgeries up here. And so they're used to bigger surgeries when it comes to that but they have been uh, very willing and very receptive to learn the difference between that and um, large complex spine surgeries. But it's again, a team, I, I can't, I wouldn't be able to stress it enough how important a team is. You, you come out or you're in fellowship and you literally, uh, you, you get spoiled, I think a little bit. <laughs> you, uh, you have extra sets of hands, you have good hands and uh, you know, it's, that's, fun and that's awesome it's it is it's just different and so getting used to the difference that there is uh, when it comes to you're the one doing all the work uh depending on where you go that's very dependent on you know if you're going somewhere with residents or not or if you're going to private practice but having that extra set of hands you know versus you're the one doing the work now one more question in your first year in practice have you been busier than in your fellowship you're very busy uh, i remember you're pretty unshaven there for for weeks out of hand there uh, during residency, and you're pretty well shaven now. So, uh, almost well shaven, I'd say, is so one or two beard beard. So, are you working harder now or not? Um, I would say it's just different. I would say that we work pretty darn hard in fellowship, but it prepares you for uh, what you have to do. It's just a difference. It's a uh, maybe I'm not doing as many cases because I don't have three block days a week, which I wish I had, but I'm working on that. Um, but it's just different types of work. Uh, the support isn't quite the same. And so I'm doing more of the, uh, I'm just doing different types of work, basically. Surgery wise, though, it is still very busy. I mean, I take trauma call at the same time. And so I'm doing trauma cases. I did a peel on last week and a 17 year old. So there's a lot of difference, uh, different types of things that you have to deal with coming out uh, that you maybe just don't even think of because they're just not on the forefront of your mind. But uh, when you come out, you learn real quick. <laughs> One, uh, one thought I want to pick up on and endorse, uh, and again, it's so cool to see you, and uh, we're so proud to have been involved in the education. Thank you for taking the time to come on. One thing I want to come on, uh, many administrators see spine kind of as a cost center or a service line that's profitable. But beyond that, uh, I really liked, and that theme resonated with me, that a healthy spine line can actually improve the overall functionings of the body, if you so will, of a hospital, because basically just like the spine connects the brain to literally all visceral organs and extremities, it also can serve kind of as a backbone to a hospital. If you have a healthy spine service, 
so many other uh, functions like anesthesiology, interventionalists, as you identified, but also uh, mineral metabolism, pain services can improve from this, PT services, all that can improve if you have a healthy spine service. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, it's huge. It's I've I can't tell you how many meetings I've had uh, with just everybody, and we've actually tried to put together a, a, a spine meeting because they didn't have it. We have a a joint and ex spine excellence meeting now uh, that we've put together where we meet, and uh, we're it's it's still a little bit of, not necessarily the beginning, but we're working into it. But we've worked on things like getting PT together uh, to figure out, you know, how do we rehab these patients because they haven't really done it before? You know, when do we do surgery on these patients? Because we always want to do the right surgery on the right patient at the right time. And have they gone through all the treatments up to that? So the pain service line, uh, you know, for everything from that to perioperative, uh, you know, and preoperative treatments. Do we need a specific spine preoperative, you know, boarding form or something like that. And it's, it's that kind of stuff, but it's been nice because it is just that it's a spine excellence meeting. We're meeting, you know, to push that forward so that everyone's on the same page and that we can work together as a team, because it's, it's literally the best way to work. You can't do it by yourself. Well, thank you. I would not do my job as a phone fellowship director without reminding you that you have a landmark paper that we still need to come to <laughs> post-operative urinary retention. So I'm going to send you an email separately, but I'm looking forward to that finalized product. Right, Dr. DeTori? That, that urinary retention, that was a big, big deal. And we'll get that to a conclusion. Okay, Ryan? That sounds excellent. Thank you. Thank you for having me as well. So back to nicotine. Thank you, Ryan, for your words of wisdom. Ravi? Nicotine and spine, an ongoing problem. Maybe you go back a slide. Yep. Great. So uh, starting again, sorry about that uh, technical disruption. So this year, uh, my project was a uh, meta-analysis on the risk of uh, non-union and smokers. Um, this was a uh, project I did with uh, multiple uh, multiple co-fellows that I had here, as well as uh, Dr. Dottori, who's um, you know who's had a lot of experience with meta-analyses, and it was um, definitely a great learning experience for me. Um, so we sought to do this project because smoking is such a large uh, public health care um, issue. And also in terms of surgical spine patients, it comprises um, a huge portion of our uh, uh, patient volume. Um, our inclusion criteria were adult patients undergoing spinal fusion, either single or multiple levels, cervical or thoracolumbar lumbar fusions. And our exposure criteria were people that were smoking one year uh, prior to their index surgery. Uh, we excluded all other forms of tobacco, such as smokeless tobacco, um, vaping, hookah, or anything else. Um, we just were looking at cigarette smoking, and we used a pretty restrictive criteria here. Um, you know, we came across dozens of other studies that had different criteria but we elected to use um, something that was fairly restrictive and we looked at patients um, we defined smoking as a one year prior to index surgery and then we um, we looked at patients out uh, at least at a year um, we also uh, graded the strength of evidence of all of these studies uh, overall, we uh, we ended up screening about 2,000 articles, and that was condensed down to a full text review of uh, 74 articles. And then we ultimately condensed that down to uh, 20 articles that were included uh, for this key question. Overall, um, between these 20 studies, we amalgamated about 3,000 uh, patients, um, which included 37% smokers or about 1,100 smokers. Uh, overall, uh, in the pooled analysis, we found that smoking was associated with an increased risk of uh, non-union compared um, to non-smoking um, with, with a risk ratio of 1.9. Um, this was also the case whether smokers were uh, having placed allograft or having autograft placed um, with a relative risk for allograft of um, 1.39 and sorry, a risk ratio of 2.04 for autograft. And then um, the same also held uh, true for our multi-level and our single level analysis with a risk ratio of 2.3 um, for multi-level and then 1.8 for single level. And then just uh, doing a deeper dive on some of our tables here, um, just pointing out some of the interesting things that I thought were uh, were clinically relevant here. When we looked at the uh, time course following smokers and non-smokers, what we actually found was that for non-smokers, their pseudoarthrosis was generally declared after one year, and there wasn't much change from one year to two years. However, for smokers, um, the rate of uh, non-union, the fusion rate actually improved from one year to two years. So this showed 
kind of that smokers actually do take longer um, for that bone healing process. And sometimes that bone healing process is just completely impaired. Um, and you can see that for cervical cases and thoracolumbar cases that smokers actually improve their fusion rates between one and two years, but not necessarily the case for non-smokers. Um, in terms of looking at uh, single and multi-level fusions, um, not unsurprisingly, we found that um, thoracolumbar fusions were associated with uh, far uh, higher rates of um, non-union for smokers. And you can see um, a, rel a risk ratio of um, nearly three in our thoracolumbar fusion group. Um, in, the same, uh, in the same table, you can also see here that multi-level procedures were also associated with a significantly higher um, relative risk of uh, non-union for smokers. And then finally, um, another interesting aspect was that, um, and this is actually Dr. Tori's idea, that to look at autograft and allograft. And, um, you know, for a while, I, it, I thought we thought that the findings were pretty curious that, um, and that autografts seem to be worse in smokers. And we found that both in cervical cases and thoracolumbar cases. Um, you know, obviously we can't, we don't know the exact reason for this, but we could hypothesize that in autograft, um, the bone itself is so impaired that even using that um, as a substrate for bone healing most likely doesn't, um, you know, confer too much benefit and actually allograft might actually be better in smokers. Uh, these are just forest plots of the same analysis that we repeated. Um, we actually did not find a difference between the subgroups um, in terms of um, cervical versus thoracolumbar fusions, even though both carried an increased risk of non-union. Um, same thing for uh, comparing single level and uh, multi-level segments. There was not actually a difference between the subgroups, but um, there was positive findings in both subgroups. Um, in terms of um, this analysis, the only uh, difference was actually between allograft and autograft. And actually, um, we did find a significant difference in terms of the uh, risk ratios here. But again, both groups were also uh, positive in that uh, smoking was significantly associated with a, a higher risk of non-union, um, at least at one year out and at two years out. So, Joe, first question, are you live? Yes, I am. Uh huh. So, explain relative risk to us. Go back a couple of slides, Ravi, if you will. So, I thought, first of all, I must disclose when Ravi proposed this project, I was less than enthused. I said, oh, this is well covered by the literature. And I'm very curious because you've just submitted this paper for peer review, what the reviewers will say. And then when Ravi showed me the gaps in the literature, that it took for granted. I was amazed. There are huge gaps. Right. Uh, they are enormous. So explain to us, first of all, what does uh, relative risk mean? Uh, like a relative risk of two, which I see down there, does that mean it's double the risk? Or what does that mean when I talk to a patient? Yeah, so there's two, there's two types of risks. One is a relative risk and one is an absolute risk. And so the relative risk is is just as the name implies, it's the amount of extra risk, if you will, relative to if you didn't smoke in terms of, of uh, a ratio. And so, yes, you're at twice the risk, but what's even more valuable in this paper, because, because Robbie actually only identified studies that presented um, absolute numbers of patients who had non-fusion, you're able to calculate what's called a risk difference. And so um, the, the absolute risk is important as well as the relative risk. And you can actually calculate what the excess risk uh, is with somebody who smokes. And so, you know, if you tell, if you tell somebody that they're at twice the risk of, of, uh, non-union well the question that i'd have if i was a patient is is well what 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 is that is that one percent that goes to two percent or is that ten percent that goes to twenty percent and that's the difference between the relative risk and the absolute risk so in this case for example if you look at thoracolumbar uh, one level the the uh, relative risk is uh, almost uh, it's a little over two and a half 2.7 and the excess risk it is 20%. So of all the of all the patients who end up with non-union, yeah, 20% can be attributed to the smoking. Some some's going to happen without 
in people who don't smoke, but the, there's going to be an excessive risk of 20%. So um, this, 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 Robbie has done a great job on this paper. He's to be commended. There's lots of, lots of information here that's not anywhere else in the smoking and spine literature. He's to be commended for this. So two quick things before we go for our final uh, paper with Dr. Rick Price. Uh, first of all, good morning. It's still morning with you, right? Dr. Eric Heyman, Assistant Professor of Neurological Surgery at the University of South Florida, Tampa. Great to see you. Thank you. Um, so Ravi and Joe, go forwards to the meta-analysis slide, and then I'll have a question for Dr. Heyman. So first of all, does this paper show the power of meta-analyses? Um, I mean, all of these studies kind of had a bar cross in the midline. They were not that scientifically uh, significant necessarily. But once you pooled the data, it became very clear that there is a effect of smoking, an adverse effect. So Joe, meta-analysis, is that, uh, is that a, a proof? What is a meta-analysis over a systematic group? Maybe just in one or two sentences. And then is this the power of an analysis exemplified here? Well, the, the answer to your second question is very easy. You see it right on the screen. Yes, the, the big advantage to, to pulling the data, of course, is that you, you increase the sample size. Um, the, a meta-analysis is a subset of a systematic review. A meta-analysis is done in the context. It's the, it's the quantitative analysis of a systematic review. Not every study has enough articles that you can actually do a meta-analysis on within a systematic review. And I think one of the papers that the fellows did on, on THC is an example of that. We didn't have enough studies to do a meta-analysis, yet it's still a systematic review. And a systematic review is much bigger than a, than a systematic search. It's a, you can ask Ravi about it. it it's about a 12-step process that can be quite, labor, quite laborious, but so that's the short answer to your questions, yes. Ravi, I have a great chat room question from Dr. Venkatesh Krishnan, and he brought up something I had not thought of. Mm -hmm. Could it be that there's more allograft used than autograft in these uh, patients? And uh, do we know the smoking history of allograft donors? The latter, I obviously assume, is we don't know. But uh, what are your thoughts as you hear this question? I thought it's a clever question. Um, what do you mean by, I guess, what do you mean so by more basically numbers? you have way more allografts available. So let's say sure. in a post-geothorical fusion, you can open up another 10 cc's of allograft right. and put in more theoretical donor mass mm -hmm. rather than from the more limited to iliac crest. So volume of graft, could that be a confounding factor? It definitely. I think that's a great point. It's a very insightful question. I guess my, my only question for that would be when we are not looking at smoking as a confounding factor, generally autograft is the gold standard. Even in studies that compare autograft to allograft, generally autograft is found in the superior um, substrate for bone healing. So that's why I think the results of this are so curious and that we, you know, we found the reverse to be true. And another great point, in, you know, in terms of the, the history of the category, a bone donor and that you know they could definitely be smokers especially you know if they were recently deceased and the smoking rates were higher several decades yeah, well, ago thank dr Krishnan for this very good question i'll have to put that in the manuscript and credit him for that yeah uh, eric our professional societies always insinuate that it's okay if we tell our patients who are active smokers to stop smoking at point zero before they go to surgery this study has a way more stringent criteria right one year one year so within one year, you're a smoker, yes or no? It's very binary. What are your thoughts after seeing this? Should we have a far more stringent kind of a selection criterion on patients when we schedule them for a elective spine fusion surgery? You're muted, Eric. Sorry, we can't hear you. I mean, I think this kind of gets into the, you know, um, some of the questions that we have, uh, you know, because smoking is a moving target with this country, you know, tobacco use is, is not the same problem it was even, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but we are seeing a rise of non or so-called smokeless tobacco products such as vape pens. Um, and so I, I think the, the, the ultimate question that really I, I think remains open is what role is this is due to, to nicotine and nicotine inhibition of bone products versus longer term accumulation of toxins 
you know, uh, tar like compounds, which in, in some studies have been implicated as the primary driver of a lot of tobacco related pathology. Um, this is actually an issue in my mind because I recently had a patient who, you know, presented to my clinic and every time I'd seen her, she reeked of tobacco, but she honestly had quit smoking cigarettes. And she didn't realize that vaping was in fact a, a form of, of nicotine use. And I found out that she was still vaping post-op day one when the nurse took her vape pen away in the hospital room. So um, I, I think it's, I think it's a, you know, unfortunately at, at a basic level, we, we still don't understand why tobacco is bad. I think, you know, well, the study helps, you know, certainly makes me consider longer term cessation than just, you know, in the immediate perioperative period. I think without a good mechanistic understanding, it, it's, it's very hard to determine what the best thing for our patients are. And we're a little pressed for time, Dr. Nuna. Uh, briefly, Dr. Uh, Sohail from Pakistan asked, what causes non-union? Uh, you did an obviously very thorough review, and there's another paper coming out of yours. Why do nicotine-using patients have retarded bone healing? What's the micro-mechanism? Is it a micro-angiopathy? It's a micro-angiopathy, exactly. It impairs the vascular supply. Uh, so how does that happen? Is it a lack of proliferation in the tissues, or is it poor vessels? What, what's the problem? I think it's both. I think it's uh, both uh, poor, poor vascularization as well as um, poor, poor healing, essentially. Yeah, from what I gather, it's a lack of proliferation. That's a genetic expression that governs uh, the arborization of uh, early capillaries. And basically, it's cut down by a factor nine uh, with nicotine use. And what Dr. Heyman says is spot on. It's nicotine that's a problem, as far as we know. It's not inhaling something with tar in it or so. It's the nicotine that causes that genetic suppression. I can't recall the name. Thank you for this very thought-provoking paper and sharing your insights with you. And it's a really solid job. And thank you to Dr. DeTore for all your uh, invaluable insight. Next up, and our last research speaker is Dr. Uh, Rick Price, originally from WashU. And uh, he took on another uh, public toxin uh, project, which was uh, novel. I congratulate him on having the idea. It's somewhat controversial. Um, it's cannabis, or THC, uh, and uh, pain management. So, Rick, good morning. Hey, hey everybody. I'm Rick Price, as uh, Trevin said, I'm from WashU. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, I'm going to talk about something that, uh, that I really thought about coming here to Seattle, um, where I trained at, at St. Louis. Um, cannabis uh, is, is illegal, and medicinal cannabis was just legalized as I was leaving. But here in Seattle, uh, uh, medicinal and recreational use cannabis is, um, is, is legal, and a lot of our patients uh, partake. Um, this introduction of surgical and non-surgical back pain is, can be rather difficult to ma uh, manage. I, I believe about 10 to 15 percent of the uh, population in the United States suffers back pain at some point in their lives. And uh, multimodal therapy uh, is is often ineffective. Is uh, and people are seeking out chiropractors, acupuncturists, as what other ways to deal with their pain. And the back pain itself is a major contributor uh, to the uh, opioid pandemic. As spine surgeons uh, routinely get asked by patients to, you know, can you give us give me some Percocet to get me through? Uh, and this is and, and through pain management doctors and primary care physicians, it, it is. Uh, a lot of these patients end up long-term abusers of uh, opioids, and it's been shown it's not exceedingly effective despite its high uh, use. Um, and the medicinal cannabis uh, has recently been uh, legalized in a lot of states in the United, uh, here in the United States. Uh, as of today, about 35 states have legalized it. And uh, cannabis has been widely studied for pain control. Uh, in particular, it's been reported to be ineffective as uh, pain related to cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, MS, and fibromyalgia. And just my experience here in Seattle, when I first started here and speaking to patients in the clinic about you know, what do they do for back pain, uh, a lot of them were taking cannabis. Uh, and part of it is recreational cannabis is legal here in Seattle. Uh, in case uh, basketball fans want to know what Sean Kemp is doing nowadays, he uh, runs a cannabis shop in downtown Seattle. Uh, yeah, you can't drive more than a block or two here. In, no, I'm joking. But, you know, the cannabis stores quite frequent here. It's just driving through town. Uh, so it's easy access, and a lot of our patients utilize it. And just 
quick, quickly asking them, like, what do you think? Do you think this helps? A lot of them really believe that cannabis helps their back pain or at least makes it tolerable to where they can get to work. So interestingly, uh, cannabinoids uh, work differently uh, through a different mechanism of action than opiates. And it makes it an attractive uh, adjunct therapy, potentially. Uh, there's two types of cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. Uh, the second type is on, on immune cells, and it's not pertinent to this talk. But the, the first receptor is present on uh, presynaptic neurons. And when you bind uh, THC or synthetics, such as ad adrenabinol or nabilone, uh, there's about 66 uh, THC derivatives that have been identified. It blocks a neurotransmitter release into the postsynaptic neuron. And this has a multitude of effects, you know, people, quote, unquote, feeling high or hungry. But then the pertinent for us is it can just modulate pain control. Uh, so looking at the literature, uh, there is seems to be some literature out there uh, regarding back pain. There's a lot on cancer pain, but I, I set out to do a systematic review to see, is this something that is well studied and something I could recommend to my patients? So our key questions, I had three of them, um, and it's, I'll go through this quickly because we're kind of running out of time, is uh, what is the evidence uh, that vacuum the chemist A, can uh, reduce pain following spine surgery? Second question is, is it efficacy in chronic low back pain? Or thirdly, uh, what about patients with uh, post-spinal uh, cord injury, as uh, cannabis has been shown to be uh, have some effect for neuropathic pain? Uh, so this is our search strategy. Uh, we use mesh terms, cannabis, THC, or other types of medical marijuana, uh, and combined it with low back pain, spine, uh, back pain, surgery, et cetera. So we searched Medline and Embase, and uh, after the duplets were removed using our search strategy, we had uh, uh, 1,738 results. Uh, we screened these title and abstract and uh, came up with 22 uh, full text articles that were assessed for eligibility. And then for our actual articles included in the study, we only used uh, randomized control trials uh, or cohort studies. And of, of all these articles, there's only four that met the criteria. Uh, unfortunately, none of the papers addressed uh, post-surgical back pain. But we did have two papers that addressed low back pain and then two papers that were addressed the post spinal cord injury pain. Uh, I'm not going to go into the weeds because we're running out of time, uh, but just quickly, I just kind of want to show uh, some of the, the results we found in our uh, papers uh, that th this is the two articles addressing low back pain. Uh, They're both, uh, or sorry, one was randomized controlled trial, the first one, uh, and the second one was a, uh, a observational crossover study, a cohort study. First one used uh, nabilone, which is a synthetic form of uh, a THC, and they showed a, uh, a significant uh, improvement, significantly improvement in pain uh, if, uh, after the uh, synthetic uh, marijuana uh, for low back pain. And in the second study, uh, they used inhaled uh, THC, and they also showed um, in 30, I think 35 patients, sorry, 31 patients, a statistically significant improvement in pain control. Uh, after, I think, four weeks. And uh, in both those uh, studies, there was no serious adverse events uh, uh, described. And then looking at our last two studies, uh, this is post-spinal uh, cord injury patients with back pain. Uh, there was a small study uh, of seven patients uh, that actually uh, did not show any statistical, statistical uh, increase in pain control, but just showed a trend towards it. Unfortunately, it was only seven patients. It was not powered really to show statistical significance. Uh, but importantly, it showed that, that there was no serious adverse events. And in our last study, uh, this was a randomized control trial out of Austria. Uh, it had 42 patients, and they used inhaled uh, THC as, uh, as uh, their uh, form of uh, drug delivery, and they showed significant uh, improvement in pain control. Uh, so just to wrap up, um, there are not many high-quality publications about cannabis and back pain. There are a lot of case reports or uh, just observational studies. But uh, through our uh, review of the literature, uh, we were very strict in what we included. And that was, as I showed, there's only four papers uh, that met our criteria and that were uh, three randomized control trials and one cohort study. And there are fortunately no uh, articles that are uh, that address cannabis as it specifically relates to post-surgical pain. Uh, in uh, three of the studies, uh, it was shown to be statistically significant at uh, reducing pain, uh, with the fourth showing a trend towards pain control. So I think that there may be something to this, uh, that it may help with back pain. 
But importantly, there's there was no serious adverse events that were reported. Uh, however, the follow-up was uh, short-term. It was only several months. Uh, there's data out there suggesting that long-term cannabis use can have um, uh, del deleterious effects on cognitive ability. And also, uh, importantly, uh, the studies did not address pre-existing psychiatric illnesses. Uh, it's been shown that uh, cannabis uh, in patients, cannabis use in patients that are uh, a that are depressed or also uh, uh, schizophrenia or mood uh, uh, disorders have a higher rate of uh, suicide after cannabis use. This is something that needs to be fleshed out. Uh, so uh, just based off the, the review that we've done, it says cannabis may be an effective uh, therapeutic option uh, for treating back pain. However, I don't think that the literature supports you know, widespread use, um, but I think that you know, for most patients coming in, I, I would not recommend it against it, uh, using it. That's all I had is so questions. Great, great job. So go back to that previous uh, overview with the synapse, uh, synapse diagram. So I thought this is brilliant how you educated us on that there's a separate pathway actually for pain control. So in your studies, were those patients on opiates also, or were they excluded from opiates? No, they weren't. Uh, they actually, uh, uh, most of the pa patients were on opiates with low back pain. But uh, it was, this was in addition to, they kept their... So uh, this is a supplemental, pressure. so, okay, exactly. that's important, yeah. yeah is so. it an augmentative effect? Is this a kind of an augmentation effect that uh, you can see? To, to the opiate theory, I don't know. That wasn't addressed in the papers. Mm -hmm. I thought this is a really important uh, uh, project that you took on. I congratulate you on it. Uh, this certainly offered insights that we had not anticipated. Um, uh, would you? How would you approach this now to go forward? Would you have a large prospective study or would you ask pharma to run, run this kind of a study? How would you formalize that the level of evidence becomes more robust? Yeah, I think a prospective study would be great. I'm, I'm, I'm aware I took a job at um, my recreational cannabis is legal as well there. And I was just thinking that there's so many patients that come in that are already using this, you know, it's easy, it would be easy to study in a prospective way. What would the ideal administration form be? Oral, inhalation, injection? Uh, based off the, the, again, there's only four studies here. Um, the studies that you, the two studies that use inhaled THC had a better effect. Uh, that, interestingly, was not dose dependent, so that may be the best form. However, some patients don't tolerate that well. You know, patients with pre-existing um, you know lung conditions. So, uh, problem another option would be that this probably easier studied would be uh, oral form, oral THC. So, thanks for that study, Dr. Heyman. Can we switch the screen to Dr. Heyman again? Eric, are you on? Uh, yes. So uh, all political discussions aside, in Florida, is THC legal at this point? I actually don't know that. And what are your thoughts on hearing uh, Rick's presentation on THC as an alternate pain uh, modulating uh, agent? Well, I mean, you know, in terms of legality, for medical purposes, it appears to be legal. I don't know the formal legal status, but a large number of patients report medical marijuana is the thing that helps them improve. I don't personally prescribe it, but, you know, just incidentally noting, you know, patients report it, it does help with their back pain. Um, seeing this mechanistic slide is sort of interesting because you can talk about the CB2 receptors, but it looks like it's expressed on astrocytes, which are actually known to potentiate, you know, we don't think of them as a a thinking cell, but they actually very closely interact with neurons and are involved in chronic pain, particularly neuropathic pain. Um, and it's been shown that targeting astrocytes, for instance, modulation of SCR1 expression, et cetera, um, and astrocyte inflammation actually has a very favorable effect on neuropathic pain, the sort of thing you'd see after a nerve injury, for instance. Um, in terms of actually providing recommendations to my patients, uh, I tell them, you know, if it controls their pain, it controls their pain, but I can't really recommend for or against it. Um, just especially in the, at least the preoperative period, I do ask them to, to stop it uh, just because one, it complicates their anesthetic plan. Um, again, that's not something I could cite in literature on, but uh, talking to anesthesiologists at Cherry Hill, et cetera, they will say patients who are chronic marijuana users uh, have a significantly more complicated anesthetic and post-operative course. Um, and the other issue is we know it has effects on the vasculature. Um, you know, I think we're starting to see evidence of aneurysms in, in young patients, uh, vasculopathy in, in younger patients who have no tobacco use, but use marijuana. Um, again, breathing in a bunch of tar is, is not great. Now, whether this applies to edibles or 
uh, vaporized THC or other forms is, is a different story. Um, but I think, you know, we know smoking is bad for you. We, we think it's nicotine, but we don't know that. And uh, until we know that, uh, in my view, it should be treated in the same category as, as tobacco smoke. Great thoughts. Uh, that was news to me that there are maybe more angiopathies or aneurysms. Rick, uh, CBD has become a very common supplement and both of our academies, uh, AANS and AUS have kind of written surprisingly favorable uh, position papers on this. Uh, does CBD go, go through a separate uh, pathway? Is that kind of a similar receptor? You no, know, it, it's a separate pathway. It's actually not the endocannabinoid. That's why we, we, we were going to include it in the study, but it, because it works differently, we don't. Uh, we did not uh, include it in the systematic review. Uh, that's interesting uh, that, that they've uh, both uh, endorsed its use because the literature is not there. Because I, I was actually going to look, look into doing a, a second uh, systematic review on CBD, and it, there was even less... Like, high quality literature out there than there was for uh, cannabis. I was very surprised by it myself because again, I did not do uh, closely to the depth of uh, literature that you had. And I was completely caught unaware of that, but maybe they just wanted to be hip and go with the times. But uh, thank you for your project. Eric, take us out of here. Come a little bit closer to the camera so we see you better. So uh, final five minutes of uh, uh, what you want, what you've learned in your first year of academic practice in neurosurgical spine surgery and words of wisdom for the graduating class. And thanks so much for uh, uh, fitting us in between your cases. Oh, yeah, no problem. I mean, a uh, couple things, I guess, closing thoughts. Uh, the first thing I learned is you never stop learning. Um, you know, uh, that, that applies to both stuff that you deliberately want to learn and lessons that you learn sort of, that you, you may wish you paid a little mention to or uh, more attention to what your, your, your mentors and your, uh, your teachers in the past had said, and you sort of learn why people do certain things a certain way. Um, and so that's, that's a valuable point. Um, in terms of, you know, just starting out, uh, it's, 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 it's a very, you know, I'm sure, you know, my co-fellows who it looks like in the audience uh, perhaps attest to this, uh, you know, starting out practice is very different because you, you you end up, you know, going from the situation where you're incredibly busy to, you know, sort of on your own and, you know, starting things off and building things up. Um, fortunately, you know, things here for better or worse have been extremely busy since I got here. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things I was really glad for my fellowship actually, you know, when I finished my residency, uh, I think as most neurosurgeons contemplating fellowship do, um, you sort of wonder whether you need to do a spine fellowship, whether it's going to be valuable for you. Um, Cause you know, a lot of things you learn during a neurosurgery residency are, you know, instrumentation, laminectomies, decompressions, deformities, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I certainly got good exposure, but you know, uh, yesterday, you know, we, I was you know, here at 11 o'clock at night doing a, a um, a reduction of a uh, T1, T2 spondylolisthesis. And, uh, you know, I used a number of tricks that I learned during fellowship and just my approach to patients, you know, was extremely valuable. So I guess those are my concluding thoughts. Well, thank you for joining us again and all of our visitors from around the world. A uh, special shout out to Dr. Luis Javier Solorosano Barrera from Barcelona and uh, Dr. Tariq Sohail uh, from Lahore, Pakistan and Dr. Krishnan. Uh, it's great to have all of you uh, around the world join us, and we're very proud of our fellows. Many, many thanks to Dr. Joe DeTore. He's been such a great mentor to me personally, collaborator, co-author, and has provided us the methodological foundation to try to share improved insights about healthcare. Never stop learning. Right, Joe? So with this, we'll conclude our great program. Thank you to our fellows, and we'll feature Dr. Elias at a later date. Thank you all, and uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Great job. All of you.